Okay, let's start uh, section 2.7, graphing techniques. There's quite a bit to cover, and it's really, really visual. So what I'm going to emphasize is that you kind of get a visual intuition. If you try to memorize this stuff, you will get really confused. But we're going to talk about transformations of graphs and different things we can do to graphs, to, to, to the basic graphs that we actually learned in our last lecture to produce new graphs. And you're going to see this principle a lot. If A is positive and A is greater than zero. So let me actually explain that to you. Let me start a new um, canvas here. So let's just look at the number line really fast. Um, I'm going to explain this technique by measurement. So I'm just going to look at the x-axis, so we're going to pretend this is my x-axis, and if you want I can draw the y-axis right down the center. We're going to just pretend that's the center, okay? But really all of my statements will apply to either, so that's the point 0, 0. But really the only thing that we care about for this part is that on the x-axis that part that tick right there is zero so <clears throat> let's let this be a number b and this be minus b now let's suppose that a some real number a is greater than one so what will happen if I multiply A times B? Well, let's look at an actual example. Let's let B be equal to 5. And of course, minus B will be equal to minus 5. And let's let A be equal to 2. 2 is certainly greater than 1. And 2 times 5 is equal to 10 and 2 times minus 5 is equal to minus 10. So what that does is if A is greater than 0 let's put it about right here 2 times minus B which is minus 10. If A is greater than 0, then it takes a point on the line and it pushes it away from 0. So if B is, notice that the absolute value of minus 10 is the same as the absolute value of 10. So the point is, if we multiply a number, any number whatsoever, by a number greater than 1, then that pushes the number away from 0. So now suppose that A is less than 1, but greater than 0. So what happens, so we will let A equal one-fifth. What happens now when I multiply A times B? Well, in that case we have one-fifth and B is five. So it shrinks it down to one. If I multiply it by minus B, one-fifth times minus B, it becomes minus one. So if A is greater than 0 but less than 1 and I multiply by any number positive or negative what it does is it shrinks it or moves that number closer to 0 we could say it is <coughs> it moves towards 0 or gets smaller in absolute value 
or moves away from zero, which means gets larger in absolute value. So that's the visual representation of what this says right here. So if a is greater than zero, then the graph of y is equal to a times f of x. So if a is greater than one, I, don't, I may have just said if a is greater than zero, that's me talking faster than I'm thinking. If a is greater than one, then the graph of y is equal to a times some number is a vertical stretching. It makes the graph go further up. On the other hand, if a is between zero and one, then the graph of y is equal to a times another value, f of x, is a vertical shrinking. <clears throat> so what we're going to do, this is going to be the only one <clears throat> that we're actually going to plot, but I want to show you uh, how this works. And we're going to start with our parent function, f of x is equal to the absolute value of x. So let's take a screenshot of this so I can work with it uh, with my digital board. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to identify the parent function, the one we already know, the one from last lecture. And that's y, or f of x, is equal to the absolute value of x. And if you recall, that's really easy to plot because every point, it's like a V, and it is centered on the origin. So basically, this point here is should be okay. Five, five, and this point here is minus five, five. Just so you know, why? Because our every point on our graph of this function is x, y, but y is equal to f of x, but f of x is equal to the absolute value of x. So I'm going to erase all of that. I just wanted to show you what was going on there. And I want that space. So this is just the graph of y is equal to the absolute value of x. And that was one of the functions, basic functions, that we looked at. And of course, this goes on forever and ever. And now let's look at g of x. g of x is equal to 2 times the absolute value of x. But that's the same as 2, and the absolute value of x is equal to f of x. So since 2 is greater than 1, we expect this particular graph to result in a vertical stretching. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't tell me an awful lot. What would a vertical stretching look like? So, let's go ahead and plot just a few points. The nice thing about the absolute value function is you get two for ones. For every negative input of x, for every positive input of x, the negative value of x is the same. So we'll just do a few points. An easy one is 0. 2 times the absolute value of 0 is 0. Another one is 1. 2 times the absolute value of 1 is 2 minus 1. 2 times the absolute value of minus 1 is also 2. Then we'll do x is equal to 2. 2 times the absolute value of 2 is 4. And then we'll go minus 2. 2 times the absolute value of minus 2 is also 4. So let's plot these points. So we have 0, 0 again. Then we have 1 and 2, 1 and minus 2. Sorry. We have 1 and 2 and minus 1 and 2. There we go. We have 2 and 4 and minus 2 and 4. And that's all I need to plot this. 
And that is what is meant by a horizontal stretching of the graph. So that's a helpful image. So this is y is equal to 2 times the absolute value of x, which is f of x. So we have one more, m of x, m of x <coughs> is equal to 1 half times the absolute value of x. But so that's just the same thing as saying m of x is equal to 1 half times f of x, because f of x has been designated as the absolute value of x. So 1 half is greater than 0, <coughs> but less than 1. It's actually right in there between them. So this is supposed to be a vertical shrinking of the graph. So let's go ahead and do the same points. We'll have 0, 1, minus 1, 2, and minus 2. I think I can get all of those there. So this is x, and this is the absolute value of x divided by 2. So when x is 0, then the absolute value of x is 0. 0 divided by 2 is 0. When x is 1, this is 1 half. If x is minus 1, this is also 1 half. Why? Because the absolute value of 1 is 1. 1 divided by 2 is 1 half. Uh, 2. So <clears throat> when x is 2, and then the absolute value of x is 2, and 2 divided by 2 is 1. And when x is minus 2, the absolute value is 2, and 2 divided by 2 is 1. So I have several points. Again, we share the same starting point, but now it's going to be different. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ignore the 1, 1 half, minus 1, 1 half, and go ahead and plot the 2 and 1 and minus 2 and 1. So here is 2 and 1. And here is minus 2 and 1. And that's sufficient because I've got two points and I can draw my line. So here I have what is called in the book a vertical shrinking. So this is y is equal to f of x divided by 2, which is the same thing as 1 half times f of x, where f of x in this case, is the absolute value of x. So this is our parent function. This is that function multiplied by a constant greater than 1. So that's the vertical stretching. And this is our parent function multiplied by a number between 0 and 1, and that's called our vertical shrinking. So that's a good paradigm example. So a paradigm example is what I would do to always study. So a paradigm example is just an example that's really easy to reproduce in case you forget. And it tells you everything you need to know. Literally, this example, once you have it, and you have these labeled, and it's really easy to produce, because literally you only need one point and then two others, I could have quit right here, or I could have not done those and done two and four and minus two and four. You could graph this really easy, and that will help you to understand what direction things happen. When A is greater than one, so the easy choice is two. When A is between zero and one, an easy choice is for A is one half. All of this is stuff I'll be using later on. So here we have another. This is a, a textbook example. So <clears throat> here again, the black is the parent function. And now we're going to suppose a is greater than 1. Then we look at the same x values. And a times y is repelled away from the 0. But the repelling in this case is 
in the up and down direction, the vertical direction, because you're multiplying a number on the y-axis. It still repels away from zero. Over here, notice we have the same x values, our parent function. But here, a is between, between 0 and 1, so that point, a times y, is moved toward 0. So horizontal stretching or shrinking of a graph function. So here again, this is kind of odd, and unfortunately they don't give an example for this. So I created an example that we will look at. Um, and I updated the example that I give you. So pretty much they, the textbook <coughs> introduces a horizontal stretching or shrinking of the graph. So here's the thing to remember. In the previous case, we were multiplying the output value, the y, by some number a. y is the dependent variable. So we literally compute what the function does to our value of x, and once we have that output, we multiply it by a, and if a is greater than 1, it repels it away from, from uh, the 0. If it's greater than, uh, if it's between 0 and 1, it attracts it toward the 0. This is completely different. What we're actually doing is we're changing the value of our independent value, the independent value. So this is more confusing than it's worth, but we will watch it, we will look at it here. So if a point xy lies on the graph, y is equal to uh, f of x, then the point x divided by a, comma y, and it's the same value of y, lies on the graph of y is equal to f of a of x. So let's look at that. And then we'll, I actually have an example we'll do. I'll do it in GeoGebra. This is a long lecture, and I can't spend time making tables of values to plot. So again, the black is our parent function. And right there is a point. It's been chosen perfectly because the y value, when the graph crosses the x-axis, is always 0. So this is x, y. So we know on the graph of y is equal to f times a of x. Now notice here, a is a constant. x is a variable, a is a constant. We find the value of the same y where x, where we have x divided by a for whatever a is. So when a is between 0 and 1, it results in a horizontal stretching. On the other hand, when a is greater than 1, it results in a horizontal shrinking. So the point moves closer to 0. Here, the point moves away from 0. And that seems to be just the opposite, just the opposite of what I just told you. Because I said, well, if you multiply something by a, and a is greater than 1, it moves it away. But that's where this point comes in. So if a is greater than 1, then x divided by a, so if a is greater than 1, then 1 over a is between 0 and 1. And that's what's, that's kind of the weird thing. So just do a lot of examples until you get it uh, in your mind. And that's the key point right there, is even though we're multiplying f x by a, the point is correlated to the point x divided by a when we're, when we're comparing the same y values. So let's bring up GeoGebra. And I have a few um, examples we'll do so you can see this. Oh, I'm just going down. So these examples are brand new. Uh, we're going to do, <coughs> this is the example 1a I just updated. So if your 1a says something completely different, it's wrong. Um, 
your book does not give an example for us to do and we're not going to do this by actually uh, graphing with the table of values we're just going to do it by using a computer just to help us see so <clears throat> our parent function is going to be x squared and right there is the value of x squared so what we want to do now is we want to let a be greater than 1 so let's let a be 2 so we're going to plot 2 times x squared Ooh, not x Ooh, that's bad 2 times x squared so that's the brown right here so notice what it does it makes it more wide they call that a what do they call it I guess a horizontal stretching and here if a is greater than zero then the graph of y is a horizontal shrinking okay so that makes sense because uh, the gray here is our regular function and then a is greater than zero and this shrank in now let's do one half x squared and that should be a widening and indeed it is so that's a widening and that's because our value of a is one half so that's they call that a horizontal stretching and then the brown here is a horizontal shrinking shrinking of what of the parent function right here in gray so let's look at some more graphs so we want to compare the graph of f of x equals the square root of x over the interval 0 to 25 so that's fine it's a closed interval 0 is in it and 25 is in it so the square root of x exists and then we're going to compare with the graph of g of x is equal to minus x over the interval when x is minus 25 to 0 so let's actually look and see what that looks like uh, we won't be using this but back to GeoGebra go ahead and delete these we won't use those anymore so what we will do here is we will do x raised to the one half and that's the value that is the actual graph of the square root function I don't uh, there's probably some way to do the square root of x but I don't know square root of minus x oh yeah just do sqr whatever I just wrote there sqrt minus x there we go now look at these two graphs so this is the square root of x there is the domain starting at zero and going on to infinity it's greater than the domain we just had here and over here I have the square root of minus x where the domain goes from minus infinity to zero so minus a minus number is a positive number so let's look at this graph let's look at a point right here and the same point right here so it's almost like if you could take the page and fold it over to the left you get the same graph so point A has coordinates 4 and 2 and point B has coordinates four, minus 4 and 2 so we call that when, when the graph of when the graph let me go back to the formal definition here uh, when the graph of the point x y across the y axis is the point minus x y we call that a reflection so here is the pertinent uh, definition the reflection of a point x y across the x axis so we're folding it horizontally we're folding it we're like putting a crease down the y-axis 
and folding it is the point minus xy. So notice, since it's about the y-axis, the y value remains constant, and the x value switch sign. So the graph of y is equal to f of minus x is the same as the reflection of the graph of y equals f of x across the y-axis. And that's just what we saw, because if x is between 0 and 25, then the graph of g of x is equal to, that should be minus x there. Oh no, that's another example. This example up here. This is the example of the graph that I just did, and it goes across the x-axis. So f of x is equal to the square root of x, and the graph of g of x is the square root of minus x over a different interval. So let's see another reflection. Another reflection across the y-axis. Or another, not across the y-axis. We already have one there. So just notice, here's the graph of f of x. Here's the graph of gx. Every point on the graph of f of x is related to another point on the graph of g of x. And how are they related? Their y values are the same, but their x values are the negatives of each other. So this is 4, 2. This is minus 4, 2. <clears throat> this is minus 1, 1. This is 1 and 1. So let's actually see an example of a reflection across the x-axis. So we don't need some of these. I will turn them off. So here is the graph. These are reflected. This is y is equal to x squared. <clears throat> this is y is equal to minus x squared. And that's a reflection across the x-axis. You can imagine putting the crease along the x-axis and folding it down, and you get the same. So let's look at two points. So we'll put a point right there. And we're going to keep the x value constant and come down and put the same point there. So the x values stay constant at 2, but the y values change sign. That's true in every case. Here the x value is minus 2. I'm going to stay at minus 2. <clears throat> so the value up here is minus 2 and 4. Down here it's minus 2 and minus 4. So that's what we say <coughs> about the reflection of a point across the x-axis is the point x, the x stays the same, and the y, y values change. Those are reflections. And hence the graph of y is equal to minus f of x is the same as the graph of y is equal to f of x reflected across the x-axis. So here it says identify some symmetry but we have to learn what symmetry is. So the graph of an equation with respect to the y-axis, so symmetry with respect to an axis. The graph of an equation is symmetric with respect to the y-axis if the replacement of x with minus x results in an equivalent equation. Uh, it's not so bad. This is actually a little bit easier than uh, the other. The graph of an, as far as algebraically, the graph of an equation is symmetric with respect to the x-axis if the replacement of y with minus y results in an equivalent equation. So we'll actually use these right here. Uh, first, we will algebraically use the test. And we will determine uh, 
what type of symmetry it is. Then I'll go to GeoGebra and we'll plot it so you can see an example. And then we'll come back and answer this question. So let's reply, let's use the test here. Ah, come back. So here is my function. So it's a, just a graph. This is this reply this applies to the graph of relations and functions. So let's test the following. So let's test for symmetry with respect to the y-axis. So we want to see, do we get the same equation if we replace x with minus x? So y, is that the same as, question, minus x squared plus 4? But x squared and minus x squared are the same. So yes, they are the same. So if you need an example here, let's do an actual example. Let's plug in a value for x. Let's let x be equal to 2. So 2 squared plus 4 is equal to 4 plus 4, and that's equal to 8. Now let's plug in a negative value for x the negative of what I first plugged in up there. But minus 2 squared is the same as 2 squared, so that's going to be equal to 4 plus 4, which is equal to 8 again. So this is symmetric with respect to the y axis. So let's take a look at that. y is equal to x squared plus 4. There we go. So it's symmetric with respect to, I just drew a point, didn't mean to, just ignore that point right there. It's symmetric with respect to the y-axis. Why? Because it passes the test and we have that if I look at just half of the graph from one side of the y-axis to the other, it's the same. They're just kind of like mirror images. Again, if you fold it down the crease, you're going to get the same. So let's look at equation, the next example. So that's literally how you test things, is you use these two tests. So we have 3b now we have x is equal to y squared minus 3. Now we kind of already know this is not going to be the same uh, if I replace, replace x with minus x. Because if I replace that with minus x, that's the same as multiplying both sides by minus. And that's going to be 3 minus y squared. And all it takes is just one easy test point. Let y be equal to 1. And we know that 1 minus 3 is equal to minus 2, whereas 3 minus 1 is equal to 2, and those aren't equal. So this is certainly not symmetric with respect to the y-axis. But let's see if it's symmetric with respect to the x-axis. So we're going to replace y with minus y. And we're going to see immediately that it is using the exact same observation we did before because is that's the same 
is minus y squared minus 3. Why? Because minus b, for any real number b, minus b squared is equal to b squared. So this is symmetric about the x-axis. So let's look at that one. x is equal to y squared minus 3. And what we're going to see is a mirror image across the axis. Again, if I just fold one half of the graph over across the x-axis in this case, I get the same exact image. So it's kind of like when you're plotting, you get two for one. Uh, if I find a, uh, uh, if I know it's symmetric about an axis, if I find a point here, I can immediately cross the x-axis and find its companion point. If it's symmetric across the y-axis, I can find uh, a point here, and I don't have to do anything. I can just immediately know what the value is going to be <coughs> over there on the companion point. So just introducing an awful lot of, of terminology here. Oh, what about 2x plus y is equal to 4? We forgot to do that one. We have to do that one. <coughs> so you already know what this is. You should know that this is the graph of a line. And it's not respect, it's in you, I hope you can guess that it's not going to be the same. So let's do 2, let x equal to 2. Uh, to show that it's not respect, that it's not symmetric, all you have to do is show, choose one value and show that you don't get the same result when you take its negative. So, so with respect to the y-axis, we're replacing the x value with negative x. So 2 times 2 plus, let's say, y, let's let y equal to be 0, plus 0. We need to let y be equal to 2. Yeah, no, y is equal to 0 is equal to 4. That's correct. But it's not correct if I go 2 minus 2 plus 0 is not equal to 4, it's equal to minus 4. Another way to do this is just solve for y. y is equal to minus 2x plus 4, and plug in a value of x that is positive, and then a value of x that is negative, and you'll see you'll get different y values. So this is not, respect, not symmetric with respect to the y-axis, what about the x-axis? So in this case we're going to solve for, see, for the y-axis we solve for y, for the x-axis we solve for x. So in this case we're going to solve for x, so 2x is equal to minus y plus 4, that gives us x is equal to minus 4 halves y, sorry, I just heard that go off and it, I thought I turned off all of my email notifications, plus 2. So if I let y be equal to 1, and y, let's make it even easier, let's let y be equal to 2, and y be equal to minus 2, and you'll immediately see we get a different answer. Uh, so y is equal to 2 and minus 2. So that's the same as minus 1 plus 2. It's equal to 1. Now if I cho choose y to be minus 2, then that's minus minus 2 over 2 plus 2. And that's equal to 3. So number c is not symmetric with respect to any axis at all. And it makes sense because if we were to plot this really fast, I know its slope is positive, and um, no, the slope is negative, and it crosses the 
y-axis at 0, 4. It's not symmetric. I can't fold across the crease of the y-axis or the x-axis, and it won't match up. So it's just not respect, it's not symmetric with respect to either. So symmetry about the origin. So the graph of an equation is symmetric about the origin if replacement of both x with minus x and y with y minus y at the same time results in an equivalent equation. So let's do that. As a matter of fact, I'm going to challenge you to do, well, I'm kind of moving that up there. I'm bringing out my digital paper. I'm going to challenge you just to think about example A. Number one, you should know that what the graph of x squared plus y squared is equal to 16. I hope you immediately thought that's the same as x squared plus y squared is equal to 4 squared. So this is a circle centered at the origin of radius 4. So let's consider that let x be greater than um, We don't have to do anything. Since x squared is equal to minus x squared, and y squared is equal to minus, best write a y in there, then I know that if I replace x with minus x and y with minus y, that I literally get the exact same equation. I get an equivalent equation. So this is, respect, this is a graph that is symmetric about the origin, and we already know what that is. It's a circle of radius 4 centered right at the origin. So it makes sense. If I fold it over in the y direction, fold it over across the y axis, or fold it over across the x axis, I get the exact same, I get the exact same graph. So what about y is equal to x cubed? So what do we know about x cubed? If x is less than 0, x cubed is also less than 0. If x is greater than 0, then x cubed is greater than 0. So let's replace minus y with minus x cubed. Well, that's the same as minus y is equal to minus x cubed. So that actually turns out to also be <coughs> um, symmetric about the origin. Here's another way to look at that. Let me slow down there a bit. It may have went. So we have y is equal to x cubed. Do I get an equivalent equation if I multiply both sides by minus 1? In other words, is minus y the same thing as x minus x cubed? So that's what I'm asking. So given given this, we want to know, that's what we're asking, if I multiply both sides by a negative, do I get the same equation? So what we're going to do is that's not right. So basically we just replace y with minus y and x with minus x. I get minus y is equal to minus x cubed. Now, back to what I was starting to say. 
if y is equal to x cubed, then if I multiply both sides by a negative, then I have an equivalent equation. These two equations are equivalent. Here, I actually showed that when I replace y with minus y and x with minus x, which is more than just shoving an x in front of it, because minus x cubed is minus x times minus x. Well, that's x squared times minus x, which is x times minus x is equal to minus x cubed. So this is also symmetric about the origin. Um, so let's take a look at that. y is equal to x cubed. You should already know what it looks like. And that also is symmetric about the origin. It's one of our basic graphs that we looked at last week or last lecture. So even in odd functions, <clears throat> this is this is a lot of this I never really used very much in grad school because um, I was in algebra, abstract algebra, and we did really proof-oriented stuff. Uh, but even and odd functions are everywhere. So a function is even if f of minus x is equal to f of x. That means the graph is symmetric about the y-axis. A function is an odd function if, of, if f of minus x is equal to minus f of x. So what you do in both cases is you take a value of x and you negate it and you get the same value as f of x when the x values are <coughs> negatives of each other, say minus 5 and 5. Here, I take the x value and I negate it, and then I compute f of x non-negated and put a negative in front of it, and are they the same? So if my x value is 5, I would compute f of minus 5, and is that the same thing as f of 5 negated? So we'll actually look and see what these are. Uh, there's a really easy rule to tell what these are. Uh, it has to do with the degree of each of the polynomials. So I'm just going to tell you, tell you the answer right now and or I might forget. If the degree degree of every variable uh, it's late at night when I'm doing this variable term is even, this is for polynomials and we're dealing with polynomials, then f of x is even. Now you can almost guess what the next one's going to be. If the degree of, and here's the key word in both places, every every variable term, we don't care about the constants, variable term is odd, then the function is odd. And if both occur, if some variable terms are even, even, and others odd,
then the function is neither. And by neither, it's neither an either, even or an odd function. Let's go ahead and use that here. So here's my variable. These are my variable terms. X times, 8 times x to the fourth, and 3 times x squared. This is a degree 4 term, and this is a degree 2 term. And those are my only variable terms. They're both even. We're going to find out that A is an even function. Here, I only have two variable terms. The degree of this term is 3, and the degree of this term is 1, because x is the same as x to the first power, and 1 and 3 are both odd numbers. So b is an odd function. And here we have two variable terms. One is even, and one is odd. So this is going to be neither. And let's actually just look at one of these, uh, just to show. And let's just compute f of 1, and then let's compute f of minus 1 for a. Well, that's equal to 8 times 1 to the 4th minus 3 times 1 squared plus 1. Well, that's equal to 8 minus 3 plus 1, which is equal to 6. 8 times minus 1, that's our base raised to the 4th, minus 3 times minus 1, that's our base, squared plus 1 is equal to minus 1 times minus 1 times minus 1 times minus 1 is plus 1. So again, that's 8 minus 3 plus 1, and it's equal to 6. So let's do the next one, 2b. So we already know, we're just going to verify that it's odd. So I just want to show you how to do it algebraically. Let's let x be equal to 2. So we want to evaluate f of minus x, which is f of minus 2. That's equal to 6 times minus 2 cubed minus 9 times minus 2. So that's equal to 6 times minus 8. Because minus 2 times minus 2 is 4 times minus 2 is minus 8. Minus 9 times minus 2 is plus 18. And 6 times minus 8 is minus 48. And I'm adding 18 to it. So that gives me minus 30. So that's one side. So now we want to check out, is that the same as minus f of x? So here we put in the value of x, which is 2. So everything that I do is going to be negated at the very end. So that's 6 times 2 cubed minus 9 times 2. which is equal to minus 48 minus 18. But 48 minus 18 is 30, so we get the same value. So that shows that that's an odd function. So it got interrupted last night, so we're just going to finish this off today. We have vertical translations left to do and horizontal translations. And then one more problem where we can just combine a lot of different uh, translations and transformations of graphs to come up with the final graph. So this is really easy. It's like, it's kind of like point addition. So if you're given a parent function f, consider f our parent function, I can create a new function, which I'll call g in this case, by adding some constant c to f. When we do say, we say g of x is a vertical translation of the graph f in the following hold. If the point x, y is on the graph of f, then the point x, 
f of x plus c is on the graph of g. So remember the point x, y, when we're talking about the graph of f, is literally the point x, f of x, because f of x is equal to y. And g is exactly the same as f of x, but I've added c to it. So there's a corresponding point on g at the same x value, but I take my y value and I add c to it. Now if c turns out to be positive, this shifts the graph vertically up by c units. For example, if c were 5, it would shift the graph up by 5 units, and if c were negative, it would shift the graph down by 5 units. So let's take a look at that. We'll just do two really simple examples. So we'll start with our parent function being a really easy function, the identity function, y is equal to x. So remember y is equal to f of x. Um, let's do g of x, maybe I can do it that way. g of x is equal to x plus 5. And there it literally shifts my parent function up by 5 units. And I'll do h of x will be equal to x minus 3. So there it shifts everything down. So let's go over here. Let's move, uh, move things up. Because I want to be able to, that's good right there. So let's look at this point right here. So on f of x, we have the point 0, 0 on f of x. But we have g of x is equal to f of x plus 5. So the point, the x value stays the same, but the corresponding y value on g of x is given by my, my y value in f of x plus 5. So that gives me 0, 5. And that's um, that point right there is 0, 5. We can put a little label on it and you'll see it's 0, 5. Well, I didn't do a very good job uh, trying to label it, but it's 0, 5. And do though down here, this is the point 0, 0 and this is the point 0, minus 3. Maybe I could change that to minus 4, so you can see that it clearly goes through 4. Because notice we only have our even numbers there. I could probably make it bigger, yeah. That works, so you can see it. Let's try some other functions, just one other type of a function. Let's let our f of x be equal to x squared. Uh, didn't take it. Maybe I have to. Maybe I have to choose a different name. I, I just use <coughs> GeoGebra. That's why uh, my analysis analysis teacher at the University of Arizona used, and that's the only reason I know it. So, our parent function is f of x is equal to x squared. So I'm going to create a new function called g of x, which is my parent function f of x minus 4. And you see it's exactly the same, but everything shifted down 4 units. Let's try something a little bit different. What about f of x plus 3? Ah, what did that do? If I tried to look at f of x plus 3, it didn't move it down or up, but moved it to the left. What if I do f f of x minus 10. Oh, it moves it all the way over here. And that's our second type of translation. It's called a horizontal translation. So given a function defined by f of x, we're going to redefine a new function by just looking at instead of f of x, f of x minus c. So then g of x is a horizontal translation of the graph f. And we just saw that right here. Uh, let me turn off the 
these this is my parent function this is f of x plus 3 it shifted it down to minus 3 and this is f of x minus 10 and it shifted it over so that the vertex is at plus 10 and indeed that's exactly the rule for every point x y on the graph x f of x there is a corresponding point notice that the y value f of x and g of x x plus c on the graph of g of x so the easiest way I'm just going to tell this can be confusing symbolically so let me just show you the rule so suppose I have the graph of f of x I know what the graph of f of x looks like and I want to know what does the graph of f of x plus 10 look like and you know it's going to be a horizontal shift it's either going to be a shift 10 units this way or 10 units this way but you don't know which well here's what you do you take what's inside the parentheses and you set it equal to zero and you solve for x and if the resulting constant is negative <coughs> then the shift is to the left if on the other hand we solve for x minus 10 is equal to 0 I get x is equal to 10 the resulting constant is positive we get a shift of that many units to the right and we can see that in my GeoGebra f of x minus 10 is this one it shifted 10 units to the right f of x plus 3 well x plus 3 equals 0 means uh, x is equal to minus 3 and it shifted to the left and the last thing we're going to do is just look at a combination of translations so what I want to do is I guess I will grab this and we will do it what I can write on the screen I wish I had a program that would allow me to to write on uh, Adobe in a really sorry that's nothing that's just this right here let's go ahead and start a new one I, I know I have access to Adobe Pro because they gave it to us that means I have to boot into Windows and Windows is so slow I hate it um, so I just use Linux and whatever it gives me so I'm talking I'm not paying attention to what I'm supposed to be doing <coughs> here we go so let's do this so our parent function so let's start out <coughs> by saying that f of x is equal to the absolute value of x it's going to be my parent function and then we're going to do translations on it so that means let's plot that function and then we'll make it's really easy because it's the absolute value function so now I'm going to do a translation of this function let's do where is it at f of x is equal to x plus 3 well that's going to correspond to a horizontal shift in which direction well, I'm going to take x plus 3 and set it equal to 0. 
and that gives me x is equal to minus 3. So it's going to be shifted 3 units, 1, 2, to the left. So let's go ahead and plot that shift. Since this is the absolute value function, you just, you just can kind of do it. So I'm just going to do this in color so you'll know that this graph color, please, if there's someone colorblind, crap it, I, there might be people that are colorblind. My brother-in-law is colorblind. I should be more sensitive. I'm going to label these. This is f of x is equal to the absolute value of x. And this is going to be... Uh, whatever color I just chose. This is going to be f of x is equal to x plus 3 right here. So let's continue on. So the next thing I want to do is I want to consider f of x. I could be relabeling these with new uh, letters, but these are just transformations of x. I could call this one f, g, h, i, j, um, and I probably should, but there, I'm just redefining f each time. So what is that going to do? So for every value of x, the y value is, for every value of this f of x here, the y value of this new redefinition of f of x is going to be negative. So what that's going to do is it's literally going to reflect it across which axis? It's going to be a reflection across the x-axis. And I guess I should definitely write this in a different color. Just again, if you wanted to rename each of these functions, I'm just redefining the function each time. And that is the reflection. Good enough. So this one is f of x is equal to minus x plus 3. And finally, we want to redefine one last time our f of x is equal to minus our previous, our previous f, f of x definition, but I'm going to add 1 to it. So this results in a vertical shift. Shift of 1. So it becomes right here. And that's going to be the final end result is when I plot this one. That's my final plot, f of x is equal to minus x plus 3 plus 1. It's that one right there. So literally, did you see what I did? <clears throat> I knew what the parent function looked like, and then I just continued to redefine the function, redefine the function, redefine the function, until without using any points whatsoever, I were, was able to draw the final, what was asked, by just using transformations. You will be asked to do this on the exam. You can either do it just like I've done here and redefine f in sem several steps, or you can say f of x is equal to the absolute value of x, g of x is equal to x plus 3, h of x is equal to minus f of x, 
uh, s of x is equal to this. It doesn't really matter. Those are just labeling issues. Um, the point is you'll show your steps, and I'll tell you what to do um, in the instructions for the exam. So um, that's it for 2.7.